There we go. Okay. All right. Good morning. Let me give everybody a chance to jump on and get everything together. And we'll go ahead and start throwing down my attendance really quick before I forget. Okay. All right. So happy Wednesday, everybody. The good news is, is that we're on the downhill swing of all this. So there's that. All right, so um, we are going to continue today with um, our same routine. Uh, the only thing that I forgot to do yesterday is I forgot really quick to discuss uh, the bell ringer question. I got, got kind of off on my schedule a little bit thinking about other stuff. But anyway, um, we'll talk really super quick about your bell ringer question. We'll jump into section two stuff. Um, and then we'll roll on from there. The other thing, and somebody reminded me yesterday, I think they sent me, I don't know if it was an email or um, Google Classroom question, I don't know. All that starts running together pretty easily. But um, the invention activity is kind of the uh, additional thing uh, for this week, since we're talking about Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, Thomas Edison, the inventor of electricity and the light bulb and all the things. So in, um, I guess in the, the mix of talking about that topic in particular, you have the invention activity that's actually two parts. There is a front and a back to it. Um, I guess I should have confirmed to make sure that I scanned in the front and back. <laughs> so I'll do that while we're on here together just to make sure. Um, but the question came um, on the uh, invention activity form. It does say, um, what is it? Um, part one is for partners and then part two, you would actually form what they call a think tank and have your partnership plus another partnership group up together. Okay. So obviously that activity was meant for the old days. <laughs> The old days of like regular school when we were all together in person, right? So anyway, it feels weird to think of it like that, but it is what it is. So I will say this, um, if you have somebody in class, um, and to be honest with you, I don't really care if it's um, my second block, you know, you guys in honors, or if it's my third block peeps, uh, in standard, you know, if you know somebody in that class that you would want to partner up with, that's fine, you know. Um, that's the, I think that's one of the biggest things about being virtual is I feel like it just isolates us so much to where we don't really have that easy option as far as working with a partner or small group, things like that, which I get. Some people love that because you, you like working individually, all right, and you're just out there living your best life, you know, I five to you guys. Um, but others who are social butterflies, you know, um, and it's killing them that they can't have the option of, of working side by side with a partner or small group or whatever, um, you have the option, all right? Obviously, it's going to be easier for you to do it individually. Um, and we'll go ahead and talk about it real quick right now since I'm already on the topic of it. Uh, but the invention activity is, again, it's two parts. It's like four or five questions on one side, four or five questions on the other. It's just meant to be a fun little activity to get you thinking like an inventor. Um, and it, it wants you to come up with something, you know, it, it kind of like being on Shark Tank, if you've ever watched the show itself, um, to where you're just presenting an idea and how you think that it would change things in the future. So it gives you the scenario of pick something that already exists today. Pick something that is a common non-electric household item, okay? Um, so I don't know, hairbrush, a fork, I don't know. I'm just coming up with random stuff as an example, all right? A common non-electric household item. And the, a couple of questions are just asking you, you know, basic things. Um, how has that changed from the past, you know? Um, think about, I don't know, let's think about the fork 
you know, the first fork was probably made um, in a variety of ways. Maybe it was whittled out of wood, you know, which might be painful if you get a splinter in your tongue when you're trying to eat with it. That would hurt. Um, you know, or maybe we were using it out of, um, out of iron, you know, we, we've got blacksmiths back in the day that are hitting it and working it out of iron, you know, how has it changed today? You know, now we have plastic cuttery that we use, um, especially if we're planning on, you know, throwing it away after we use it. So how has it changed? And then of course, the big question is how can you improve it to make it better? Maybe you can make your own um, Swiss army fork to where it transforms into all the things. One minute it's a fork, one minute it's a knife, it's a spoon, it's a spork, it's all the things, right? I don't know. I'm just literally coming up with stuff off the top of my head, all right? Um, and then part two on the back is wanting you to think futuristically, okay? We are in 2021, but it wants you to take it a step further. What do you imagine things looking like in 2051? You know, and in my mind, 2051, um, it's all like we're living in Star Wars. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like we, we're all holograms, you know, we're all riding in our spaceships, right? And I'm, I'm pretty, I'm hoping they keep the Tahoe around. I like my Tahoe, you know, and maybe just the wheels flip up and I'm like flying in it instead of driving. That would be awesome. I'd be all for that, right? So anyway, uh, that's what it wants you to do. I want you to think futuristically, what would things look like in 30 years from now compared to what we got going on already? So anyway, quick, fun activity, just supposed to get you thinking, but there's you a couple of options as far as how you can do it. Um, again, obviously it's easier if you uh, did it individually, but feel free, feel free to pick um, somebody to partner up to have a little bit of fun with it that way too, okay? But that's just what somebody caught yesterday. They caught them off guard because it does say with a partner. And like I said, obviously that was from back in the old days, um, back when we were together in person, okay? All right, uh, any questions, comments, or concerns before we jump into it? Um, otherwise, we're just gonna get in, get out, get it done, and move on with our day. I do want to apologize really super quick. Um, it's taken me longer than I anticipated to get your grades into PowerSchool just because I'm answering emails and, and you know multitasking. So I apologize for that. That is my top priority today is to finish getting that stuff in PowerSchool. Um, mostly because ooh, I about threw up in my mouth when I saw this yesterday, is that uh, you guys get progress reports in another week. And I was like, oh my God, not ready for that, you know, because this is week two, right? We are in week two and you get progress reports um, after the first three weeks. So um, I'm going to start you know, trying to ramp it up and get those grades in there so that you have an idea of where you are at, you know. Um, okay, so here we go. Let's talk about your bell ringer. And like I said, if you have a question, um, please let me know so I don't just bypass anybody and I'll make sure I'm watching the chat. Um, oh, yeah. So to answer your question, yes, you can do it individually. All right. So on the invention project. Okay. All right, um, super quick, let's hit your bell ringer question. It said, what did cities on the East Coast offer that you couldn't find on the Great Plains? That should be pretty easy. Um, factory jobs, um, apartments to live in, not sod houses. Um, the option to go to the grocery store, all right? If you live on the Great Plains, um, the closest town is probably going to be uh, hours and hours and hours away. If you're lucky, all right, maybe you've got to go to the next state or territory to get to an actual store. Um, a lot of people on the Great Plains have to rely heavily on the railroad and making it to the railroad station and having things shipped to them. And that's why they're having to order uh, via catalog, all right? And think of the, the catalog, the order catalogs as um, like a super Walmart in a book form, all right, that you can flip through that catalog and buy anything that your heart desires 
but you better hope you don't need it anytime soon because it's going to be probably a solid six to eight months before you actually get it because you have to mail off your order all right they have to get it they have to put it together and ship it back to you via the railroad so it's going to be a solid I don't know, I want to say at least eight months before you're going to see whatever it is that you purchased. And that's if you're lucky, right? Um, I can only imagine if uh, back in the day they were as lucky as us and they could hit that Amazon Prime and get that two day shipping, man, things would be a lot different, right? Okay, so there's your bell ringer. Let's jump into it for section two, because in section two today, we are talking about our very first millionaires and billionaires in the United States. These guys who, uh, quote, made America. All right. All right. So here we go. Um, the one, the only Mr. Uh, Vanderbilt, Cornelius, Cornelius, sorry, Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, who is one of those rags to riches stories because he had like 10 cents in his pocket, came from a poor family um, and just made himself like through determination, hard work. Uh, he was nicknamed the Commodore because he got into the shipping industry to begin with. And when he saw like, again, these, these entrepreneurs, these businessmen, they can, they can see into the future and know what's coming. Well, he knew railroads were the next big thing, right? So he sells off all of his ships in his massive shipping industry, sells off all his ships, invest everything he's got into railroads. Billionaire. Yeah, billionaire. All right. And when I say billionaire, like, I mean, when his kids turn 21, like they get, you know, $20 billion or not. Anything. $20 million as a present, right? That's what I'm talking about. You know, adopt me, please, right? I'd like a $20 million check. So, you know, his, his family is super wealthy, okay? His grandson, his grandson is the guy who builds Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina, all right? Um, his youngest grandson from his... Um, I believe it's that's, that's his second son um, that has George Vanderbilt. Um, so again, that's, that is the wealth of this family, all right? The power, the wealth. It is because of the Vanderbilt family that we have Central Station in New York. Um, so anyway, he's controlling the railroads, right? So here's your questions. Let's knock out these questions really quick. Chapter 12, section two. It says, uh, how did railroad expansion lead to industrial growth? Again. Wait, which one are we on? Are we on the IDs and SQs or on the uh, reading activity? IDs and SQs. We'll always do that first. Okay, where's, okay, sorry. Never mind. No, you're fine. I'm sorry. But we'll, we'll always do IDs and SQs first before we ever look at anything um, in the, the packet. Um, but yeah, so your answer to number 10 is we are moving people and goods in double the time, right? Moving people and goods. That's why we're able to, to grow so fast because we can move people and goods. Well, and not just that, not just people and goods, but we can, you know, push mail and communicate faster. I know we've got the invention of the telephone, but it's going to take a while to lay the lines and for people to actually be able to afford it in their homes, all right? Uh, fun fact, I love fun facts. I'm such a history trivia nerd. Uh, fun fact for you. So um, the White House obviously is gonna be the first place to get a telephone installed, uh, but the president, Hayes, he couldn't call anybody because nobody else had a phone yet, you know? But I guess it was cool just to say you had it, right? So. All right, look at question 11. It says, uh, why was the country divided into four time zones? Well, it's because of the railroad. It's because of the railroad. We gotta make sure the railroad runs on time. So the time zones are created because of the, the railroad. Now, here's a fun fact for you. And I, I don't know, it might be a question in your packet. Maybe it is, but I'm pretty sure it's on your uh, unit test as well that 
we can tell where the sun or, or we can tell the time by where the sun is at noon. So wherever you are, what state you are in, all right, you look up and wherever the sun is at noon straight above, all right, you know that it is noon there in whatever your region of time zones is. And that's how they figured it out, all right? Now you should know from world history that it's, you know, the Greeks and Romans helped us figure out uh, times and clocks and, and being able to sundials, you know, all the things, but there you go. We got time zones because of the railroad. And 12 says, why might politicians be tempted to accept gifts of railroad stock? Money, it's all about money. All right, I'm very sorry to say, you guys might think in 2021 that politicians are corrupt. These guys don't have nothing on politicians in the late 1800s, all right? These people were literally only in office to make money, all right? I'm being dead honest with you, okay? Because again, don't have a lot of laws and restrictions like we do today on things, all right? Okay, so your IDs, really super quick. Um, the Pacific Railroad Act is actually gonna be put in by Abraham Lincoln. And it's because, all right, so a quick, short, fast definition would be um, gave owners land to sell in order to build the railroad. Gave land to sell in order to finance the railroad. All right, so here's what I mean by that. These railroad construction owners, um, instead of getting money for building the railroad, they are given land on either side of the railroad tracks. So they can sell that land for whatever they want. All right, so they could probably make 20 times more money off of being able to sell that land versus what the government would probably have paid them through an actual paycheck. So it made it happen faster because they're like, heck yeah, I'll take all this land, you know, and charge outrageous prices. Now, are people going to pay these outrageous prices? Yes, because they want to build their stores and restaurants and apartments right there beside the railroad to create these railroad towns because they know that's where people are gonna to wanna to settle, right? Because it's an easy place to get your goods, transportation, mail, all the things, okay? All right, um, last couple really quick. Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, monopoly owner of railroads. Monopoly owner of railroads. Jay Gould, um, let's see. He did a lot of things. He's a, he's a smart guy. Um, sold stock. He sold stock and he actually, oh my God, I don't know how Vanderbilt didn't kill this guy because Jay Gould watered down stock and made Vanderbilt pay like millions more than what he should have. Uh, and the guy walked away being a millionaire that way, you know, and Vanderbilt found out, like I said, I don't know how he didn't like kill this guy because he made millions off of him. But yeah, he watered down stock. And what I mean by that is he's in the basement of the company printing off like false stock and selling it that way. All right. Yeah. It's all legal during this time period. Anything goes literally. All right. Last one. Credit Mobler is a railroad scandal. Write that down. The credit mobiler is a railroad scandal. Railroad scandal. And it actually happens under Ulysses S. Grant's presidency. He's a great general, terrible president because he makes a lot of bad decisions. Just throwing that out there. But it is his, um, it's, it's part of his staff that all go behind his back and start buying and selling public land uh, to finance the railroad. It's, it's a big mess, but these guys walk out making millions too. It's a big mess. Okay. All right. Let's hit the packet really super quick and then um, we'll move on with our day. Okay. So again, we're looking at section two today. Let me get mine pulled up really fast. I thought I had it. 
And again, I'm sorry. I think this is one of the pages that is sideways for some reason. So we don't do for section one, uh, 13 through 16. Uh, no, we skipped those, you know, and no, anytime we skip something, you don't have to do it unless you're bored and you just really want to. Okay. I was just making so sure. I want to make sure that I'm not behind. So what we just did now, we just skipped the first ones to that, or do I need to go back and watch a live? Because I don't have, uh, the first part of that. I, I got you. Answered. I got you. Okay. All right. Thank section you. One stuff. Yeah. We did that yesterday. Oh, I did that. I just didn't think the questions matched up. Are you talking about for the IDs and SQs? Yeah, this is the guided read I wrote for yesterday's. The, yeah, the guided reading is the first page in the packet. We did that yesterday. Oh, okay. All right. I got confused there for a second. I got it now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in your packet, we're on page two, and it should say guided reading 12-2, and it's fill in the blank, which is good because that means we'll go through it um, pretty fast. All right, so just follow along with me again, usually one or two word responses to fill in the blanks. All right, section one says, after the Civil War, railroad construction expanded dramatically. Number one, the railroad boom began in 1862 when President Lincoln signed, this is actually your ID, the Pacific Railroad Act. That's your answer again, it's on your ID sheet and you know how to spell it, Pacific Railroad Act. Mine is not popping up. The packet? Yeah, let me, can I, is there a way to flip this? Yeah, let me show you. Okay. Because it's like not, see I got 12.2 and it's like nothing there. Oh no. It's just pages. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, unless, you need to try like reloading it or refreshing it or something. I don't know. It's like that for mine too. And I think it's because when you want to open it with Google Docs, the pages are sideways. Uh, okay. I'm just going to do another one and just write as you do. Okay. Well, here's, yeah, what I would suggest. Um, yeah, if you're having that problem and I'm going to try to go in today and see if I can fix that, but I don't, I don't know. I'm going to try and be careful because I don't want to mess anybody up. Um, but I'll see if I can go back in and fix that. But if you need to, in the time being, grab you a piece of paper um, or open a Google Doc and just write it down like that. Um, and I'll see if I can figure out how to fix this. So I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm just going to write it out in a separate. Yeah. No, you're fine. Yeah, just, yeah, just jot it down on something for right now. Um, so number one is the Pacific Railway railroad act um number two the blank railroad had primary investors who were known oh this one has two answers for it um the central pacific that's the first blank central pacific railroad had primary investors who were known as your second answer is big four that was the nickname there were four owners they were known as the big four all right, number three. Number three is going to be a unit test question. All right, number three says, it's got two blanks. Number three says, because of a labor shortage, that's your first answer, labor shortage. Because of a labor shortage in California, about 10,000 workers from, does anybody want to guess what country in Asia we start bringing in people to work on the railroad? Any guesses? China. Yes, China. Yeah, that's your second answer. Um, workers from China were hired. 10,000. We bring in 10,000. Um, and you're like, oh my God, we're not paying our workers, but a couple of cents an hour. It's still better. Believe it or not, our working conditions and stuff were still better. They were still willing to come. Um, and they were also willing to work with explosives, which is another reason why we were excited to hire them because our workers were like, uh -uh, I ain't touching that mess. Okay, all right, next section says, the expansion of the railroad spurred America's industrial growth. Number four, 
Railroad companies stimulated the economy by spending money on three things, timber, steel, and coal. Those are the big three things that the railroad needs, timber, steel, and coal. Well, actually iron, sorry. Switch it out, I'm sorry, switch it out. Put iron instead of steel, that was my bad. Switch that out real quick. All right, number five says railroad blank resulted in seven giant systems that controlled most. Oh, uh, your answer for number five. Um, railroad, hold on. Railroad monopolies. Railroad monopolies resulted in seven giant systems that controlled, that's your answer, monopolies. Which we're gonna talk about how monopolies become illegal later on. Number six, before the 1880s, each community set its clocks by, what did I say? We're setting our clocks by watching what? The sun. All right, okay. sun at noon. You're gonna write those three words, sun at noon. That's how we figure it out. I have a question. It might sound kind of stupid, but I mean, I've never really kind of understood monopoly, much less monopolies and how it became illegal. Was that kind of like, I don't know. Could you explain it? <laughs> okay. So yeah, the reason why monopolies are so bad and like this is true for the game itself too, is that when you own all of something, you control the price of it. So if I control all shoe companies in the United States, I can control the price, the supply, uh, and the, the quality. Like I can sell you crap shoes for $100 because, well, if you want shoes, you're going to have to buy them from me and you don't have a choice. So that's Ain't what that I'm no, kind of? Say that again. Ain't that kind of still a thing? Because I mean, there are shoes that are way, or I, I know this is just an example and I'm going off your example, but ain't that still true in the sense of like people still overcharging stuff like necessities, for example, and I don't mean to get weird, but like tampons and pads, condoms, uh, birth control, well, birth control is free. Um, and like, other forms of contraceptives. All right, so we do have several laws in place um, to where monopolies are illegal, but again, companies do still have a little bit of wiggle room as far as um, supply and demand goes, you know. Um, they still, for the most part, can control price, but a lot of times the price depends on um, the materials that go into making it, like our economy is like a roller coaster. And if prices right. on things go up, like for example, gas, you know? So if something happens and we have several oil rigs that go down and our gas supply is limited, the price is gonna go up just because uh, it's high demand, but low supply. So sometimes the price of those items depends on the price of the materials that go in it not necessarily the company trying to make a killing off of it. Got you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so that's just something else to think about when you, you think about the price of something. Um, all right, last couple of questions and then if anybody has any uh, anything else, we'll make sure we get it. All right, uh, number seven says, to make all rail service safer and more efficient, that's your blank, efficient, and everybody should know the second answer. The American Railway Association divided the country into four what? Time zones. Time zones. Time zones. That's right. Again, that's going to be a unit test question. Time zones. All right. Last couple of questions. To encourage railroad construction, the federal government gave land grants to many railroad companies. Number eight says during the 1850s and 60s, the federal land grant system rewarded railroad companies thousands, well, no, 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 hundreds of thousands, sorry, hundreds of thousands of acres of land. Hundreds of thousands. All right, this is it. We'll be done. 
The great wealth many railroad entrepreneurs acquired in the late 1800s led to the accusations that they had built their fortunes through dishonest means, and they did. Number nine, Jay Gould was a railroad owner who was famous for um, watering stock. And that's kind of like a slang phrase for uh, cheating, being dishonest, but watering stock. Uh, and number 10 says the credit mobler. Again, that is on your ID sheet. The credit mobler scandal involved public lands and stockholders of the Union Pacific Railroad. So credit mobler. Several answers are actually on your ID sheet for, uh, for that page. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I got for you today. Questions, comments, or concerns? You cut out there for me on number 10. You said it was credit, credit what? Credit mobler. Okay. And it's, it's the last ID in section two. Um, if you need to know how to spell it. Um, but like I said, that's all I got for you today. Has anybody got anything else? Questions, comments, concerns? Uh, and as always, if you ever have something you want to talk to about individually, you can always feel free to hang on for a minute. Um, but besides that, that's all I got for you today. I got a question about power school. Okay, go ahead. Um, I got logged out and it's asking for a passcode. Where can I get that? Because I don't know that. Um, what I would say is I would shoot Miss uh, Parrish an email and okay. ask her uh, for that information. Yeah, good deal. All right, anybody else, especially if it's um, yeah. Um, I'm just letting you know. Um, I won't be available tomorrow for the Zoom call because I go in at nine, so I won't be available for any of them. So I was just gonna give you a heads up. Okay. All right. Well, the good news is, um, is you know, for the most part, we'll be doing our our same routine. Uh, we'll work out what I'm going to attempt tomorrow just because we kind of get cut short because this unit has four sections and tomorrow is going to be our last Zoom. I'm trying not to do, do Zooms on Friday for not just for you guys, but for my own sanity. It's nice. Oh. To have a little bit of a break. Um, so we are going to try and squeeze in a little bit more tomorrow so that we can wrap up on sections three and four. Um, but it'll be finishing up the IDs tomorrow. That way, as soon as you do that, you can go ahead and turn it in and don't have to wait. Uh, and it would be one less thing to have to worry about on Friday too. Just throwing that out there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we'll work on finishing up in the packet to where all that you have left in the packet and you don't have to do this until next week um, is do that story activity. And then I think there's like a, a timeline. But again, both of those shouldn't take you but a couple minutes to do on on your own. What story activity? Um, it's it's in the packet. I think it's the last page in the packet. It's a pretty interesting story. I think it's fascinating because it talks about the very first telephone and how telephones have changed. I think there's like okay. three, three questions to answer at the end. Yeah, yeah. I see it now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. All right, anybody else need me or y'all just haven't been paying attention and you haven't logged off yet? <laughs> <laughs>